analyzing the values and limitations of cooperative firms. The purpose of this document is not to provide a partisan analysis of the effect of worker cooperatives from an ideological motivation. This is much more a learning project and a document that provides mostly descriptive utility for people wishing to understand and discuss issues relating to worker cooperatives. I personally do not want to posit myself as a, as a person of authority on this topic whatsoever. I do believe that I am fairly competent when it comes to putting together and synthesizing information in a way that makes sense and that logically follows, especially when I get into my like analysis of the things that are detailed. But nevertheless, I don't want to posit myself as an, you know, as a, as a person of authority on this. And as such, anybody who goes through any of this and is able to elaborate on it or suggest additions or revisions to any of the document, completely open to hearing it. Okay. This is more of a, once again, a learning informational based project more than an ideologically based one. In this document, uh, I will cover the following things. Number one, I will give a bit of a preface, a bit of background information, a bit of naming of the different terms um, that have descriptive utility in understanding how worker cooperatives work and how they function, as well as answering a lot of the questions in regards to outside investment, which tends to be one of the initial things that is being talked about whenever co-ops come up. Like, oh, how do you secure outside investment? Is that really a thing? And then, you know, flip side, you'll have people saying, oh, well, as long as it's not 51%, then it's all fine. And the answer is like, you know, neither of the two, it's not impossible to get outside investment, but it's not as easy as a lot of people are making out for me. The answer is somewhere right down the middle. And I'm going to explain. Then I'm going to talk a bit about resilience. So how well the worker cooperatives survive within markets compared to conventional firms. Then I'm going to talk about the wage structures. So worker co-ops have a fairly original wage structure, which brings about a lot of the effects and a lot of the consequences of worker cooperatives. So this could be things like, for example, why they are so resilient. But this wage structure also causes a series of issues, which will be talked about as well later in the document. Next point is productivity. Basically, how productive worker cooperatives are, how much they produce given the same level of input uh, compared to conventional firms. That's the next point. We're going to talk about that. And the last is worker satisfaction and well-being. So how well workers feel represented and how well they perform within uh, worker cooperatives on a sort of like uh, on a mental level, a job satisfaction level. And then after that, I'm going to give the conclusion where I talk about what the values are, what the positives are with worker co-ops, what the limitations of them are, and then list a series of potential policy proposals um, based on the findings of this document. And also naming one type of policy that is commonly talked about, which doesn't seem to be substantiated by this at all. Preface. The purpose of this document is to provide a nonpartisan analysis of the current data on the benefits and limitations of cooperative firms in the modern economy. If you have any suggestions for revisions or additions to this document, please send me an email at rosarist404 at gmail.com. There are three main types of firm structures which can fall within the umbrella of cooperative firms, and a fourth, which shares certain aspects of a cooperative more so than a conventional firm. Whether or not cooperatives should be classified as capitalists or socialists is ambiguous, outside the scope of this document, and in my opinion, of little importance when it comes to making progress. The names for the three cooperative models were produced by myself to allow for easy understanding through the descriptive etymology of the word. So what I mean by this is that this document will be primarily concerned with cooperatives as a means of, you know, structuring a firm. And there are different sort of, there are three main models of cooperatives that I personally have identified. And to my knowledge, there doesn't exist any sort of like commonly agreed upon terminology to distinguish the three from each other. And because of that, 
I made my own version of these three terminologies uh, of these three terms just to provide like an easy descriptor of them to increase understanding of it. The fourth one I'm talking about is not a cooperative, but it shares certain aspects of cooperative firms and therefore may be affected by some of the findings of the literature I will discuss in the document. And that's why I've talked about them here. So examples of worker cooperatives, complete autonomous cooperatives. These firms operate with either direct or representative democracy. This means that either, if it is a often a smaller firm, all the decisions are run with direct democracy. So all the, the owners, the shareholders, which are all the workers, have one vote and then they vote on the different company decision making and on the different company decisions. That's one way of running a workplace democratically. The second way is to represent the democracy. This tends to take place when the business or the firm is larger. So this is basically representative democracy, just kind of like how our, you know, governing structures work. If there is more hierarchy needed within the firm to keep logistical efficiency going, then how it might work is that the different cells of workers elect their manager and then the managers do their stuff and make their decision making, maybe elect the board of directors or however that might work. So those are the two types of democracy you might have within the firm, direct or representative democracy. Now, when it comes to the ownership of the firm, for complete autonomous cooperatives, this means that the firm is 100% owned by the workers who work at that firm. There are no external shareholders. That's type of cooperative number one. Cooperative number two, also two criteria. The first one, exactly the same as the, uh, the complete autonomous cooperatives. They operate with either direct or representative democracy. And the second point is that these firms are majority owned by the workers at the firm. So the external uh, shareholders do not hold voting shares. So while the company isn't 100% owned by the workers who work there, and there are external shareholders, these external shareholders do not have voting shares. So they cannot vote on any of the decision-making processes amongst or within the internal workings of the worker cooperative. The third point, majority cooperatives. These firms operate with either direct or representative democracy, same as the other two. And these firms are also majority owned by the workers at the firm. And the example, the difference between this and the last one is that some external shareholders may hold non-controlling voter shares. So in this example, there may be external shareholders. However, these external shareholders may hold voting, you know, uh, shares, so they can vote on external decisions or sorry, internal company decisions. But it's always like the, the cumulative power of the external shareholders votes will always be trumped by the, uh, the voting shares of the workers who work at that firm. So the maximum that this could possibly be is a majority cooperative where 49% of the company is owned by external shareholders with voting shares. So this means that technically, even though they have voting shares, the workers who own the other 51% can technically overrule whatever they say uh, when it comes to the internal workings of the firm. So these are three types, in my opinion, and for descriptive utility, they should all be called cooperatives. Um, but they have very different ownership structures. Now, the fourth one is an ESOP, employee stock ownership firms. So these firms may be operated in any way. There is no real, you know, like, oh, this needs to be democratically run. They can be democratically run, just like conventional firms today can be democratically run. And the workers who work at these firms all own some part of the company. So what this means is that it could be like plenty of business do this today, right? Where you have plenty of conventional firms. However, a large part of the uh, the workers who work at the firm may hold shares in the company. Not enough to for them to like overrule the decisions of external shareholders, but they hold shares. The reason why this is included here among the cooperatives is because in the document, I will be discussing several effects of worker ownership on things like productivity and stuff like that. And while this, you know, these studies were made to study co-ops in specific, a lot of these sort of findings they make can also extrapolate on employee stock ownership firms. So that's why this is included here.
The first three are far more similar in nature to the fourth, as they all require some form of democratic operation, as well as for the firm to be at least majority owned by the workers who work there. Notably, the key principle driving the primary three models tends to be maximizing income, while maximizing profit is the key principle for the fourth. What does this mean? Well, cooperatives have a sort of different sort of key driving goal from conventional firms. So conventional firms, we all know this, the main goal is to make profit, make hella bread, okay? However, for cooperatives, often the main goal is not to make the most profit, it's to maximize the income, the wages of the people that work at the firm. Oftentimes, you know, all or the majority of the shareholders, um, the workers of the firm, basically. And because of this, this is a key distinction between, you know, ESOP and conventional firms and cooperative firms. Cooperative firms tend to maximize income while uh, other firms tend to maximize profit. As such, it is hardly fair to characterize the fourth as a cooperative, but nevertheless, it will still be included here as many of the patterns demonstrated in the upcoming literature applies to them as well. Towards the end of the document, I will provide a more comprehensive list of the observable values and limitations of cooperative firms. However, I wish to touch on the topic of investment and financing here, as it is important to understand in order to be able to properly interpret the rest of the document. So at the end, I will provide a more comprehensive list of the values and limitations of the firm as a whole, but investment and financing is one of the important things that is often brought up and is important for the understanding of the rest of the literature. In order to understand a lot of this, I will now talk about investment and financing for a brief period of time. So here is a table of the possible avenues of capital financing in the form of internal equity, debt, and external equity, whether or not they function for the models of cooperatives mentioned, ESOPs, and for conventional firms. So here is a table of a bunch of ways by which firms can acquire equity, can acquire investment, can acquire capital in order to grow or start their business. So here we have the ones available for complete autonomous cooperatives, these being cooperatives that are 100% owned by the workers who work there. These are the ones for autonomous cooperatives, these being the ones that are majority owned by the workers that work there, and the shareholders are not allowed to hold voting shares. These are the avenues available for majority cooperatives, a cooperative in which the majority of the shares are owned by the voters, and external shareholders are allowed to hold non-controlling voter shares. Here is the avenues for ESOP firms. So pretty much conventional firms where um, a portion of the workforce owns part of the company. And then these are the avenues possible for conventional firms. Member capital contributions is basically when you buy into the company initially, with, which is what happens in a lot of initial like co-ops. Uh, that's how you acquire your share oftentimes is a capital infusion into the firm. It's one way of acquiring capital. Donations, another way, right off the board. Crowdfunding is another way. Loans is another way, applies for all. Pre-selling, which is basically when you sort of like, you may give out like a, a gift card for a certain amount of, of money to a firm. And then when these people come back and buy from your firm with that discard, that sort of stimulates your economic growth and leads to in increased growth in the future uh, when that amount of you know money that you gifted to the other person in the form of a gift card isn't worth as much as a percentage of the whole company's capital as it did previously. Consumer memberships, these are basically, I'm sure you all know about this, at least in Sweden, it's a pretty common thing where like there's all types of businesses and then before you check out like, hey, are you a member of our, you know, super exclusive members club where you get these crazy discounts and 7,000 spam emails about the new types of eggs we have brought up, um, you know, in our store today. That's what consumer memberships are. Bartering is a very, very alternative and fringe way of acquiring capital, but it's still applicable for a lot of smaller firms. So I'd put it here. It's possible for all firms. Grants and subsidies, fairly explanatory. Asset sales, basically selling assets of the firm to acquire more capital. Divestments, um, basically allowing, you know, other external companies or shareholders to basically buy part of your your franchise part of your operations basically and you know you lose that part of the franchise that part of the business but you receive capital in return sponsorships 
I think we all know what sponsorships are. The reason why it's yellow for complete autonomous cooperatives is that I could see this going either way. I could see certain cooperatives being like, yeah, it's fine because technically they don't own part of the company. And, you know, depending on how they choose to compensate it for the, you know, for the sponsorship in itself. Oh, what well, they don't own part of the company. So it's fine if we like rep this specific thing or whatever it is. Uh, but I can also see other corporates being like, no, no external influence. No, nothing. It's only us. So that's why I have it in yellow here. Non-voting shares. Whether or not the firms can um, put non-voting shares up for investment uh, by external shareholders. So basically, you can, you know, put up non-voting shares for autonomous majority cooperatives, ESOP firms, and conventional firms. You can't do it for complete autonomous cooperatives because, once again, these ones are 100% owned by the workers who work there. Non-voting shares with board seats or reserved uh, or board observer rights. So these are like the non-voting shares. The person who owned these shares still are not allowed to vote in the decision making of the firm. However, they're allowed to sit in at board meetings and observe what's going on. Exactly the same type of people who are able to do the, the non-voting shares are also able to do the non-voting shares with board seats or board observer rights. This depends on company policy. Non-controlling voter shares. These are shares that people can vote with, but they are never going to be majority and they're never going to outweigh the shares owned by the workers at the firm. These can only be sold by majority cooperatives, as autonomous cooperatives still do not want to give voting rights to any other shareholder except for the workers. The final is controlling voter shares. Basically, voter shares owned by external investors that can control in a significant way with a majority uh, how the firm functions and how the internal decision making goes. And this is not available to cooperatives. So, as shown in the table, there are possible avenues for outside equity to be obtained by cooperative firms alongside the general debt and internal equity for, uh, sources. However, there is an important caveat to obtaining outside investment through shares of cooperative firms. Because labor is a cost of production, it's a wage, and co-ops seek to maximize income for workers, an investment into cooperative shares will always be a riskier investment than an investment into a conventional or ESOP firm. This is because the holders of the voting shares, the workers, can choose to allocate more revenue to labor in the form of wages as a cost of production and as such not take it out in profit. So what does this mean in English? Well, basically, because of the fact that co-ops tend to want to maximize the income of the workers who work there and income is paid out in the form of wages, which is a cost of production in a firm, then because the workers own majority working share of the firm, they can choose to allocate high amounts of money to that cost of production. And that money is not taken out in profits because the shareholders don't get money straight from the revenue. They get the money based on the profits. What this means is that technically you can have a, you know, an investor uh, who invests into like non-voting shares of a cooperative firm and they're expecting to get like a return or for it to be a profitable investment but the co-op basically just says no fuck you because we have exclusive rights to the voting and the internal processes of the firm in itself we can choose to allocate a potentially all of our excess revenue that otherwise would be profit into our cost of production into paying income into paying wages for our workers and therefore the external investors don't get a good return on their investment because the money is never taken out in profits. Sometimes there can be no profit, really, if all the money is put into incomes and the co-op doesn't seek to grow as a firm. So that's why an investment into these type of shares for worker cooperatives are always riskier when you invest in cooperatives than when you invest in conventional firms. And that's an important distinction to make. So while it is possible for like all of this for these like these four square five squares here to be an external investment a sort of as a source of outside equity for cooperatives there is a stronger disincentive for outside investors to invest in cooperatives than for conventional firms
This is this is not only true theoretically, but this is also one of the reasons why co-ops typically have a harder time raising outside capital. That's why, uh, even though it's possible for these forms of shares to be bought by outside investors in worker cooperatives, it doesn't happen as much because it's a riskier investment. Uh, because labor and income is a cost of production, not something that is taken out from the uh, from the profit, which shareholders have a have a have a control over. So while it is seldom the case that cooperatives only compensate their workers in wages, it nevertheless remains a comparative risk compared to conventional and ESOP firms for investors. Because of this, there are fewer sources of external equity for cooperative firms than for conventional firms, and this makes it harder to raise capital. If this typically doesn't happen, this sort of hypothetical of workers just being like, okay, well, you bought into our firm, now we're just going to choose to allocate all the excess revenue into the cost of production of labor and basically screw you over. Even though that typically doesn't happen because we do see that a pretty substantial part of the compensation that workers in worker co-ops get for their work comes in the form of the shares that they own in the company, it's still a risk. It's still a possibility. And because of that, it is still something that, that makes the comparative risk in investing in co-ops less than investing in, in, uh, in conventional firms. So because of this, there are fewer sources of external equity for cooperative firms than for conventional firms, and this makes it harder to raise capital. On the other hand, cooperative firms do gain more on member capital contributions, that's this that we talked about at the very beginning, as well as likely qualifying for more grants than what conventional firms do. However, from the research, it doesn't seem to make up for the loss of, uh, of external equity within external investment compared to you know conventional firms. There are ways for cooperatives to circumvent difficulties in acquiring capital, such as conversion, which, along with much more, will be covered in the cited literature. So that's the whole sort of investment debacle that comes with worker cooperatives, is that it is harder for them to acquire outside equity, it is harder for them to acquire, you know, outside investment, external shareholders, because those types of investments into worker cooperatives are more risky than conventional firms. Whether or not that risk is borne out empirically doesn't really seem to be the case because it doesn't seem to be the case that all of this, that, that you know, all these cooperatives just pay out their, you know, their revenue uh, to the workers in the form of like wages. It seems that a lot of the way, the law of the compensation comes from the shares that the workers own. But nevertheless, even though it's not really borne out empirically, it's still a theoretical risk. And why take that risk? As for the data collected in this document, it is limited to works published in the 21st century. Note that just because the work may have been published in the 21st century, this does not necessarily mean that the data sets were obtained in the 21st century, only that the work itself was produced less published within that time period. This is basically just like a limitation I put on myself to make sure that the data is more like, you know, applicable to current times and to make sure that's more applicable and it's a higher likelihood of it being better quality data as well. However, just because a study may have been published in let's say 2004, this could very well mean that the data set that 2004 study is examining is like 1970s to 1990s. A key limitation to practically all the literature presented within this document is that the sample sizes may be small slash selective. As an effect of this, it is difficult to prove causality for a lot of the relations found. The reasons for this are covered in some of the citations. This will be taken into account for the policy recommendations at the bottom of the document. So because there are relatively few cooperatives that exist, uh, there are a lot of possible issues with sample sizes. This is basically something that I found in the vast majority of the studies I read in preparation for this document. And as such, it's an important caveat to this. And questions arise like, oh, well, what if the increased survivability of the firm is just because there are so few of them and there are higher barriers of entry, so they come in with much more research and much more dedication than the average conventional firms, and therefore they have higher like rates of survivability. Like, that's a question you may ask. Uh, within, you know, when it comes to the, the sample sizes. And uh, that's been something that's been considered. And the solution to this is by trying to encourage, based on the existing patterns we see for worker cooperatives, trying to encourage policy, which creates more worker cooperatives in the specific sectors for the specific goals that we found, find them 
being useful for. Resilience. I don't think I'm going to read through each of these citations by myself. The reason why I'm not going to just go read through them is because it's going to take like literally forever. But I'm going to point out like key points here. Generally, for resilience, it seems very well agreed upon, even amongst more critical literature of worker cooperatives, which I've included a few examples of those within my document. Even they seem to agree that they are more like they have a higher survivability than traditional firms. Basically, failure rate for cooperative firms tend to be much, much, much lower than in conventional firms. Uh, this one doesn't specifically have percentages, but there are a few interesting things here uh, to find here. So beyond them finding that they are more survivability and they have a higher, you know, survivability, uh, they also mention a few interesting things. So this is quoted directly from the study. On the other hand, existing theoretical and empirical research points to financing constraints as a key limitation on the creation of worker cooperatives and the shift to less capital intensive industries by US worker cooperatives also support the, this conclusion. So basically, once again, mentions the issues of acquiring outside equity for worker cooperatives. And as such, you may see worker cooperatives shift to less capital intensive industries. Worker cooperatives in the United States are almost always created as new enterprises by using funds from the worker members themselves. The liability of adolescence experienced by new worker cooperatives makes this viable only where the initial capital requirements are low, the expected profit rate is high, or both. Except in circumstances like these, workers are likely to choose conventional employment rather than the uncertain rewards of collective entrepreneurship. So basically, when you do collective entrepreneurship, when you start a co-op from scratch, it's a risky investment because you all have to put up a lot of capital initially for your ownership of the company and early companies crash all the time. And despite the fact that worker cooperatives have a astronomically higher survival rate than conventional firms do in the early years, it's, it's still definitely a risk. And the reason why they might have so much of a higher survival rate is because just less people tend to make those risks. And because of that, it's only the people that are super confident, only the people who try to do this in industries where capital requirements are low, the expected profit is high or both. And so once again, issues with raising capital and risks for new cooperatives is what this is highlighting. Notably, however, these factors tending to inhibit the formation of worker cooperatives are greatly reduced when the creation occurs through the conversion, this is what I mentioned previously, uh, of an existing firm with the exception of portfolio diversification. So once again, there are some issues with outside investment still, but through converting a conventional firm into a worker cooperative, a bunch of the limitations of worker cooperatives just gets thrown right out the window because the initial risk isn't there. There's typically already an establishment. The risk of failure is just practically like extremely, extremely low at this point. There is already like accumulated capital within the firm. So a bunch of the different like difficulties uh, with worker cooperatives are just strongly mitigated. So this one has a few more percentages. Uh, samples from 2000 to 2009 um, show that the three-year survival rates for co-ops incorporated in 2005 and 2006 was 81.5% compared to 48% of conventional firms in Alberta. So it is much, 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 much higher for cooperative firms than for conventional firms, um, which supports like the general trend that we see uh, for most of it. Co-ops operating the same field as other co-ops, housing, water, and sewage, generally had better survival rates than those which are more innovative. This marks the start of another trend that we will see throughout this literature, which is that co-op intensive industries tend to perform better. The co-ops within those industries perform a lot better than co-ops engaging in industries that don't have as much cooperative involvement in them, which is something that's very interesting and we'll be talking about more later. So once again, securing financing, it was considered challenging for more than half of respondents in this survey. Coordinating with different regulatory organizations was one of the most significant challenges for co-ops in maintaining their momentum, optimism, and financial viability. A lot of this has to do with the fact that a lot of just like tax codes and general sort of financial infrastructure isn't made out for cooperatives because they aren't really like a, a common form of business organization. Reasons for failure of co-ops were most often cited as being rooted in external factors, particularly shifting markets and regulatory requirements. Internal factors were cited less often, but included a lack of united vision and dishonesty among the members. The main resources respondents felt like they lacked were someone to provide membership and or coordination of activities. So basically lack of co-op specialization when it comes to managing and running a cooperative firm. 
startup capital or a venture capital fund, and a package available of resources upon incorporation. When it comes to Uruguay, we see more things. After excluding micro-enterprises and controlling for differences in effective tax burden faced by two types of firms, the hazard of dissolution is 29% lower for worker-managed firms than for conventional firms. The higher survival rates for worker-managed firms seems to be associated with their greater employment stability. More on this in the wage structure part of the document. Worker-managed firms outperform traditional firm, conventional firms under both recessionary and expac expansionary macroeconomic conditions, so both in booms and recessions. The fact that worker-managed firms survive longer may partially reflect self-selection by both worker-managed firms into industries and workers into organizational forms. So once again, another issue with small sample sizes. Big study with a whole lot of statistics from Quebec. 62% of co-ops survive after 5 years and 44% after 10 years, compared to 35% after 5 years and 20% after 10 years for conventional firms. Basically, a, a whole lot more uh, survivability. Co-ops retain the higher survivability regardless of the quantity of employees. So this specific study, what they did was they compared worker cooperatives and their survivability for less than 5 employees and more than 5 employees. And... Regardless of which one you were using, they still outperformed the conventional firms. However, notably, the survival rate of co-ops with less than five employees is higher than that of cooperatives with more than five employees. Co-ops also survive better in rural areas than in urban ones. Here you talk about a lot of the, the things that were mentioned in the previous in the first source. Some more things that make the cooperatives successful according to the analysis of this paper. Three factors also indicate a historical advantage, as well as the business environment of co-ops. So, strong representation in economic sectors that fulfill basic needs, including agriculture, forestry, residential services, funeral services, and education, are shown as a success factor. The majority of co-ops operating in both regional and sectoral networks, so once again, the more co-op intensive, the better they perform. Support of primary and secondary organizations, which favors improved project management of startups in the development and presence of financial and fiscal tools and resources, which are adapted to the co-op model. So basically more co-op competence and once again, things that have to do with acquiring capital. Murray, uh, examine the survival rates of co-ops in British Columbia. So somebody mentioned that there's a lot of Canadian studies here. This is true. The reason for this is because there is a lot of localization of heavy cooperative intensive sectors within different parts of the planet. So notable examples of this are Canada, Uruguay, Spain, Italy, France to some extent. These come up fairly frequently in this research because they have fairly co-op heavy sectors and therefore are more like a prime target for research. Do you know why co-ops survive better in rural areas than in urban one? That seems interesting. So reasons for this might be that in rural areas, that's something that's elaborated more upon here, co-ops also tend to have better like community relations than what conventional firms do. They tend to do more sort of have better fringe benefits, fill the needs and respond to needs of communities in a better way than what conventional firms do. On top of that, co-ops are more likely to form in rural areas and because of the sort of like a snowball effect talking about the things that i mentioned previously how sectors with more cooperatives perform better uh, co-ops in sectors with more cooperatives perform better than in sectors with less cooperatives and also depending on the industries uh, like we meant what like we saw previously uh, co-ops tend to perform a bit better in ca less capital intensive industries because of difficulties in acquiring capital and rural places rural uh, sectors tend to be less capital intensive than urban ones. So those are a few reasons for why that might be. So once again, the five-year survival rate of both operating and dissolved co-ops is 100 out of 150, 66%. By contrast, Industry Canada figures so 43% and 39% five-year survival rate for conventional business startups in 1984 and 1993. So once again, this is what I mentioned. Even though the study was published in 2011, the data sets may still be older, but nevertheless still supports the bar trend of them being far more resilient. This study uses data on all U.S. public companies as of 1988, following them through 2001 to examine how employee ownership is related to survival. So this applies to ESOPs as well. So that's why I included ESOPs at the very beginning. Estimation of using Weibull, which is a type of like uh, calculation model, survival models show that companies with employee ownership stakes of 5% or more, so this is actually like fairly little, this is only 5%, were only 76% as likely as firms without employee ownership to disappear in this period compared to both and compared both to all other public companies and to a closely matched sample without employee ownership. 
So a less weird way to put this is that uh, firms with employee ownership stakes of 5% were 24% less likely to fail within the time period that they were considering. While employee ownership is associated with higher productivity, the greater survival rate of these companies is not explained by higher productivity, financial strength, or compensation flexibility. Rather, and this is something that's going to come up right now when it comes to the wage structure, the higher survival rate is linked to their greater employment stability, suggesting that employee ownership companies may provide greater employment security as part of an effort to build a more cooperative culture, which can increase employee commitment, training, and willingness to make adjustments when economic difficulties occur. And now we're going to get into probably one of the most interesting things, at least in my opinion, when it comes to a super strong benefit that worker cooperatives have compared to conventional firms. This is the wage structure and the benefits and some of the harms that come with that. So because of the way co-ops work, because every worker has a share in the firm, during economic downturns, what conventional firms tend to do is they tend to lay off employees, they tend to cut working hours in order to make up for the economic downturn. However, what worker cooperatives tend to do in higher frequency is that rather than fire people and cut down on working hours, they tend to just lower the wages and accept like lower revenues, lower margins and whatever to keep everybody employed. And as such, there is more stability within the firm because they can weather poor economic conditions within the firm far better than what conventional firms can because they're able to sort of operate at a more subsidi uh, more subsistence level of, of, of production and of, of revenue generation at the end. Now, this subsistence operation is then later made up um, for because when the, you know, the, the economy takes an upturn again and things start looking better, bang, there we go. They already has, as opposed to all the other firms that may have laid off people, that may have gone bankrupt or whatever, they have a firm up there, ready to go, all these employees, they can get on their feet really quick and start producing and start making back the revenue they lost during the economic downturn. And because of this, they are much more resilient than what traditional firms are. Now, there are some issues with this type of rate structure as well, because... Well, not specific. When it, when it comes to their ability to sort of like cut profits or sorry, cut wages in order to retain employment and stuff like that, this seems to be a good thing. However, another aspect of the wage structures of worker cooperatives, which is notable, is the fact that their wage sort of like tiers are much more compressed than those of conventional firms. So what this means is that while in conventional firms, you might have like this, the, this like the scale of like possible wages within a conventional firm. Like you have all these sort of options. You have the people at the very top, they're being paid the most. People at the bottom, they're being paid like, you know, fairly little. And you have like all the space in between. The person at the top, maybe pay like 300, 400 times as much as the person on the bottom. So that's the, th those what conventional firms look like. However, under cooperatives, this is much more compressed. It's called a compressed wage structure where basically the people at the top don't earn as much, they, they don't earn as much relative to the bottom um, people do in regards to wages. The median wage goes up dramatically though, but for the people who typically would be making a lot of money and a conventional firm, they now make less money within cooperatives because it's much more compressed. So the differences are a lot more compressed than under a, a conventional firm. And those have a whole series of effects, which I'm gonna talk about right now. Investigates the difference between worker-owned and capitalist enterprises with respect to wages, employment, and capital in Italy. Employment was somewhat less responsive to product market shocks in co-ops than in capitalist firms, which is consistent with the notions that enterprises where workers command a greater voice would protect workers from employment reductions. Wages tended to be more sensitive to product market shocks in co-ops than in capitalist firms. So this just rephrases what I mentioned previously, right? In conclusion... Worker co-ops had a 40% lower wage, had 40% lower wages than capitalist enterprises on average, not by mean on average, more volatile wages and less volatile employment. Given the quality of the data set analyzed, the authors argue these results can be regarded as having a broad generality. So, 40% less wages. Reason for this, and this is talked about in another study, is that and also talked about by me before when I talked about the financing bit, is that not all of the compensation for the workers come from the wages. 
A lot of it come from compensation for the shares that they own within the firm. There's another study that talks about that the wages are lower in co-ops than in comparable conventional firms. However, when you factor in the increased compensation they get from the shares they hold in the company, then it exceeds that of conventional firms. So that's what's being illustrated here. Uh, Peritin, 18. Uh, when market conditions change, worker cooperatives review wages first and keep employment more stable. Like what we mentioned before, cooperatives drop wages rather than reducing the workforce. Worker co-ops are larger than other firms and not necessarily less capital intensive, although they may be created more often than firms in less capital intensive industries, all else being equal. So once again, capital thing. Now, this might sound counterintuitive to a lot of people. Wait, how are there so few co-ops? But worker co-ops are larger than other firms and not necessarily less capital intensive. This means larger on average. So the reasons for this might be, number one, because they have higher survival rates. So therefore, they are more likely to weather the initial periods. There's less co-ops in the sort of startup phase because they don't always like collapse and start up as much as conventional firms do example. On top of that, a lot of existing co-ops are the product of business conversions, like I talked about previously. So they are the product of firms uh, deciding that, okay, you know, we're going to become a cooperative and turn an existing conventional firm into a cooperative. And because of that, they already start at like a pretty like good and decent size. So that's why this, this, this larger than other firms makes sense, even though it might sound counterintuitive. Yeah, the reason for co-ops being, being on average larger is likely because a lot of existing cooperatives were converted from traditional firms. They are present in most industries and differences in industry distributions with conventional firms vary from one country to another. So once again, illustrates the general point we see here where co-ops perform a lot better in certain sectors and in certain industries than in other. And this can vary even on a national level. So a lot of volatility within worker cooperatives. Burden et al. 2009. The paper measures the cooperative behavior of worker cooperatives and capitalist firms in regards to wages and employment responses in Uruguay. So once again, this exhibits the exact same thing I was talking about previously, um, that, you know, they tend to cut wages to keep employment and traditional firms tend to cut employment to keep wages. Now, here's an interesting, here's where we talk about one of the negatives that come with the more compressed wage structure. This paper studies the effects of a more compressed worker-managed firm's WMF's compensation structure and what effects they have on employment. The paper has two key findings. Firstly, there is a small wage premium associated with being employed in a worker managed firm, which declines significantly with the increasing firm. So this is just basically, and you know, according to this study, which is more recent than the first one we talked about, there seems to be a more wage premium, there seems to be higher wages for worker cooperatives compared to conventional firms of similar sizes. The second key finding, which is super interesting, worker managed firms suffer from brain drain. The separation hazard, which basically means risk of like leaving the business of high ability members, high skilled laborers is more than three times higher than that of low ability members. Moreover, it finds that there is a relationship between the extent of pay compression and the severity of brain drain in worker managed firms. High ability workers are less likely to exit a WMF whose wage structure is less compressed. The explanation for this is likely that these high ability workers would be able to attain a higher wage in a non worker managed firm as the wages are less compressed. So that's what I talked about previously, because the wage structures are more compressed within worker managed firms. What that means is that somebody who is on the upper end of the wage structure within a cooperative could be earning more money by being on the upper end of the wage structure for a conventional firm. So for their same skill set, for their same abilities, for their same competency, they're compensated less in a worker co-op than in a traditional firm. And because of that, you see that they're more likely to quit the worker cooperative than like lower skill members and people that are lower on the sort of cooperative pay ladder uh, tend to be. However, there's one notable exception to this pattern, that being high ability workers who were also founding members. These high ability workers have a far lower separation hazard rate than other high ability members. So while somebody with like a PhD, for example, who joins, you know, a worker cooperative firms may have a high risk of separation, a high rate of leaving. If that person had, had like founded the firm, if a PhD person had founded the firm, their risk, their likelihood of, of, of losing, of leaving the firm is much lower than a PhD who joins the firm in the meantime, which, which makes sense, obviously.
However, the cost of equality associated with brain drain and inferior management quality may be outweighed by other labor discipline benefits, such as higher motivation of shop for workers, greater workplace cooperation, and lower supervision costs. Log et al. examines the productivity and survivability of worker cooperatives. Worker cooperatives and other employee-owned enterprises generally pay wages that are competitive or better than locally prevailing wages when profit sharing, bonuses, and dividends are including. Co-ops are less likely to lay off workers during economic downturns, once again, thing that I mentioned. They tend to also offer better fringe benefits than conventional companies within their field. Productivity, the next point. So, general findings here before I go into the specific points. Generally, we tend to see that worker cooperatives are more productive than conventional firms. However, this tends to be highly dependent on the sector that we're talking about and the prevalence of other co-ops. And so it's very dynamic. And that's why there is one study here, for example, that claims that there is no possible, um, what's it called, that there is no productivity increase. So yeah. That's one of the key important things uh, that needs to keep in mind. That productivity generally seems like, yeah, it's higher in co-ops, but it's very dependent on the sector. Right now, the thing is kind of like it's either the same or it's a bit higher or cooperatives than for conventional firms in, in certain sectors. It's pretty dynamic, but th that's sort of where we're at right now. Considerable evidence from the developed country shows that participatory worker cooperatives and employee-owned firms can match or exceed the productivity of conventional firms. The survival rate, once again, of worker cooperatives and employee-owned firms appears to be equal or surpassed that are conventional firms. Uh, it seems clear from the empirical literature that the farm and business cooperatives have a net positive impact on value added per hour when both the cooperative and its member units are included in the analysis. In sum, there is no great accumulation of evidence to suggest that worker cooperatives and employee-owned enterprises are less productive than conventional firms, and substantial evidence that they are at least equal and probably exceed the productivity of their conventional counterparts. Next here is a meta-analysis. Don't we love meta-analyses? Can we get hypers in chat for the meta-analyses? We love them. We love to see them. A meta-analysis of 102 samples representing 56,000 some firms aimed at studying the effects of employee ownership on productivity. The analysis found that employee ownership has a small but positive and statistically significant relation to firm per uh, performance, around 0.04, so 4%. The effect is generally positive for states with different sampling sizes, so basically just talks about that this is general, this is generalizable. It found no difference in effects on performance of publicly held versus privately held firms, stock or stock option based ownership programs, or differences in effects across different firm sizes. So this seems to be true whether or not the shares of the company can be publicly bought, as long as there is like worker ownership and employee ownership of part of the firm, there seems to be more productivity. It found that the effect of employee ownership on performance has increased in studies over time and that studies with samples from outside the USA report, whoops, report stronger effects than those within. Once again, another thing that depends on the country, another sort of more dynamic aspect to worker cooperatives. They perform better outside of worker cooperative, outside of the US than within the US. There is a possibility of bias in sampling where employees in ownership firms are less likely to respond than employees in non-ownership firms. Additionally, among the pool of employees, employees most influenced by employee ownership may also be more likely to respond. However, finds little to no evidence of publication bias from the things that they talked about, from the studies they talked about. In closing, by drawing on studies from multiple disciplines that include samples from firms around the world, the present meta-analysis provides more generalizable inter inferences on the role of employee ownership on performance. So, once again, uh, even though it's a meta-analysis, even though it finds a, a significant correlation, once again, everything is held back a bit about uh, the, the sampling size. Another pretty big study. This one was extremely positive towards worker cooperatives. And I, I checked, I didn't find much, you know, like conflicting stuff about that or, you know, in indications that the research might be weird. So I included it. And then here's one that's a lot more critical. So we have a little bit of both here. The paper compares the productivity of labor managed firms and conventional firms using two new panel data sets covering several thousand firms from France, including representative samples of conventional firms and all worker cooperatives with 20 employees or more in manufacturing and services. It finds worker cooperatives to be as productive or possibly more productive overall than conventional firms in most industries. These findings suggest that the way the worker cooperatives organize themselves and their production is probably more productive overall than conventional firms way. In several industries, French worker cooperatives produce in such a way that they use their current inputs better 
than conventional firms, which could produce more at their current levels of input than if they behaved if they behaved in the same way as worker cooperatives. Univariate comparisons show that worker cooperatives are not smaller than conventional firms in all industries, so size things what we talked about previously, and are observed to expand their capital at least as fast as conventional firms. This is the part where I was a bit skeptical of, because it doesn't seem uh, from a lot of the other stuff that this tends to be the case, that they expand their capital as well as conventional firms, but I've included it here anyway. Although we find consistent evidence that worker cooperatives are at least as productive as conventional firms and do not produce an inefficient scale, behaviors observed for both types of firms as well as differences between the two groups seem to vary across time periods and stages in the business cycle and are not entirely homogenous across industries. So once again, talks about the differences here and the dynamic of you know how they might perform in different sectors of the economy. Here is one of the more critical ones. This paper analyzes the relative productive efficiency between cooperatives and investor-owned firms in Portugal, utilizes two calculation systems to reach its results. The first system, benchmark random effects model, suggests that cooperatives are on average considerably less productive than their investor-owned counterparts, and this result applies to the majority of the 13 industries considered. The second, which was preferred by the authors, system GMM calculation system is much less conclusive and does not conclude that cooperatives are generally less efficient than investor-owned firm. firms. Nevertheless, it finds no evidence that cooperatives are more productive than investor-owned firms in any industry. Notably, the research does not conflict with the general idea that cooperatives have significantly higher survival rates. This data seems to suggest that the performance in, work in productivity for worker cooperatives is highly dependent and varies greatly depending on the industry. So, once again, this provides more sort of information detailing that the rise in productivity is not just like uniform across all industries, all sizes, yada, yada, yada. It tends to be fairly specialized. By use current inputs better, is that kind of the same thing as saying they share knowledge and human resources within the co-op and then traditional firms? That could be one of the reasons. What it basically means is that the inputs are the things that you enter within a production process and the outputs are what you produce for it. So given the same level of inputs, the same, for example, maybe level of labor, level of capital, uh, you know, stuff like that, they were able to produce more outputs with it than what conventional firms are. Uh, that's what they mean here. Wor worker satisfaction and well-being. This just generally seems to indicate that, hey, more workplace autonomy, more employee ownership tends to just make people feel better and just perform better and they're more satisfied and they have higher well-being. I don't necessarily know if I want to, if I need to read through much of this as, as I've done with the other ones. Um, it's mostly just like repeats the general trend. This connects the social trust and the effects of worker satisfaction and well-being to certain aspects of productivity. So this one I can read. Our findings suggest that unlike any other type of enterprise, cooperatives have a particular ability to foster developments of social trust. This supports the view that the development of cooperative enterprises and more generally of less hierarchical, I will never be able to say the word, hierarchical models of governance and of enterprises that do not aim purely to maximize profits may play a crucial role in the diffusion of trusts and in the accumulation of social capital. Trust reduces uncertainty and transaction costs, enforces contracts, and facilitates credit at the level of individual investors, thereby enhancing the efficiency of exchanges and encouraging investment in ideas, human capital, and physical capital. So, once again, even more talks about like the effects this might have on productivity. Uh, directly. And uh, once again, same limitations for a lot of them, Pot potentially selective sampling. Negative relationship between job demands and organizational commitment with significant capitalist firms. It was not maintaining worker cooperatives. This is actually from South Korea, which is pretty interesting. Uh, more worker satisfaction. They were more satisfied with the uh, home aids at the worker owned participative decision making organization were significantly more satisfied with their jobs. More be better attempts on, on uh, company culture. This analysis of the data set finds that shared ownership forms of pay are associated with high trust provision, participation in decisions, and information sharing, and with a variety of positive perceptions of company culture. It also associated with lower voluntary turnover rates, which basically means lower rates of people leaving the firm, and higher returns on equity. The random effects estimates mainly reflect comparisons between rather than within firms, raising the possibility that there are unobserved firm characteristics that help account for these findings. Nevertheless, these results indicate that group incentives are likely to have a positive effect if implemented in the appropriate way, with supportive HR policies rather than on their own. So once again, basically employee ownership good.
because this one's pretty interesting. Uh, investigates two major cooperative leagues, Mondragon in Spain and La Liga in Italy. La Lega. And the way that they interact with other cooperatives and form economies of scale. The findings suggest that co-ops from veteran markets which have a pre-established cooperative league. On the one hand, it seems that players would have an incentive to form such a league since they can look forward and calculate the incentives of other players to participate in this league once it has exceeded some critical threshold. On the other hand, if the cost of forming such a league is borne primarily by the early movers, then players would have an incentive to wait and let the others go first. As such, the absence of cooperative leagues is believed to have a disincentive for the formation of new cooperatives. What this means is that basically co-ops perform better in co-op heavy sectors, uh, sectors with cooper cooperative leagues already. And reasons why there may not be more cooperative leagues is because the initial cooperatives who try to accumulate a lot of market share within these new sectors take a lot of the initial costs of making the environment more suitable to general co-ops and other co-ops that join later are going to have less of that cost. So they're going to be able to have higher like margins, for example, and just perform better with an easier uh, level of, of growth, for example. And because of that, there's a bit of a th free rider problem of, oh, who's going to move first, you know? And because of that, nobody's really going to move first and less sort of sectors are charitable towards cooperatives. Um, and generally, this, this sort of modifier this has on the performance of cooperative is it basically just tends to make everything better, tends to mitigate the limitations of capital acquisition, tends to increase productivity, uh, tends to encourage innovation and stuff like that. So it's just basically overall all around a good thing. Because of this, the absence of cooperative leagues, the absence of a lot of cooperatives in an industry by themselves is sort of like a disincentive for the creation of new ones. Conclusion. Based on the literature... I should have just ended it there, based, and the conclusion based, and then we close it now. Uh, based on the literature presented in this document, we can identify a number of values and limitations of cooperative firms. The values, these are the good things. These are the cool things. This is what co-ops do good. Cooperatives appear to be significantly more resilient than conventional firms, both during regular market conditions and especially during crises and downturns. As such, cooperatives may be an effective way of reducing unemployment. The compressed wage structures and collective ownership of cooperatives lead to a higher median wage compared to similarly sized conventional firms. So once again, higher median wage because of the compressed wage structure. The compressed wage structure also forms a more equitable wage distribution, reducing inequality and the need for additional wealth redistribution policies. Less inequality, basically. So less need for, like, government to post hoc reallocate resources and do redistribution of wealth because it is primarily distributed in a more equitable way. Cooperative firms appear to be more productive than conventional firms, although this is more true for certain sectors than for others. So, once again, uh, highly dynamic based on exactly what type of sector we're talking about here, how much more productive they are. Worker satisfaction and well-being appear to be higher in cooperative firms than in similar conventional firms. And this also applies to uh, firms with employee ownership programs, ESOPs. All these positive effects are increased depending on how co-op heavy the sector of the economy is. So this has to do with the league thing of the last study. Now, for the limitations, okay? Because we're providing a nonpartisan uh, descriptive analysis of worker cooperatives on the economy. First limitation. How to prevent the abuse of contract labor. So what this is, is you employ a worker for a short period of time and then you fire them before they're allocated their vote and or share of the company. The reason for this is because a lot of cooperatives have, for good reason, a company policy which entails that you are not allowed to buy into the business, you're not, you know, provided your share of the firm until you have worked for the firm for X amount of time. Uh, to prevent like abuse of, you know, like uh, the internal structures and the internal workings of a worker cooperative. However, because of that, there may be patterns of behavior in which a cooperative firm allows people to come on and work for them for a set period of time and then fire them right before they're given their share of the firm. And this is, you know, similar to contract labor. So it's often called like the, the contract problem when it comes to worker cooperatives. This is an issue. Next issue. How to capture high-skilled labor. So, like I mentioned previously, due to the more compressed wage structures, the high-skilled workers often have a higher rate of resignation. How to mitigate the free rider problem. 
Due to the fact that there is a collective rise in income based on overall firm performance, some workers may not pull their weight. Basic textbook 101 free rider problem. How to mitigate the startup costs for cooperatives. Starting up cooperatives from scratch is an expensive and risky endeavor for the founding members of the firm. How to compensate for the lack of certain sources of outside equity. Due to the nature of cooperatives, certain means of procuring outside equity, so in this case of obtaining outside investment from shareholders, from outside obtaining outside shareholders, external shareholders, um, because this is unavailable uh, to cooperative firms. So how do you compensate for the lack of obtaining this type of capital for obtaining outside equity? How to motivate cooperatives to try experimental practices. Due to the fact that cooperatives on average have less capital to fall back on, and that the workers' livelihoods are strongly tied to the performance of the firm, engagement in innovative and risky practices may be reduced. Um, so basically, there is like a downward pressure on innovation by worker cooperatives because less capital to fall back on if the venture is bad, and also because you have to like convince a broader pool of people whose livelihood is highly dependent on the, the well-being of the firm as a whole. Potential policy proposals. I might make... A lot of market socialists mad right now, but I don't care because I'm correct, okay? The current literature on cooperative firms does not warrant blanket mandates for cooperative firms on the economy as a whole, or even specific sectors of it at this point in time. Additionally, a co-op mandate on certain sectors or the economy as a whole may reduce or get rid of certain premiums discussed in this document, and as such, more research is needed before we consider such policies. These policy proposals are aimed at taking advantage of the established benefits of co-ops, as well as facilitate the production of new, more comprehensive literature on the role of cooperative firms in the economy. I'm going to say this for myself, that this is something that I did poorly, okay? Before doing all this research and producing this document, there has been plenty of debates in which I argue either explicitly or implicitly for a blanket mandate of worker cooperatives on specific sectors or on the economy as a whole. I was wrong. And I'm going to admit that now because, yeah, that was the case. And I realized this through the creation of my document and through the research that I found there. Best thing to do now, well, I produced this. I am a lot more educated on the topic now. And I'm now able to understand this topic a lot better and be able to advocate for my beliefs in a lot stronger way. Potential policy proposals. The addition of tax incentives for the cooperative firms. Preferential tax codes, which lessen the tax burden of cooperatives, would encourage their growth. This also reduces the needs of government redistribution programs, making up for the loss ta of tax revenue, as well as stimulates economic growth, which generates more tax revenue. So talking about, okay, you know, having more preferential tax codes encourage the growth of worker cooperatives. We can see we have more cooperatives. They will probably, you know, tend to flock around certain industries, which are more likely to be industries they do well on. We will obtain more data and we will have a, a basically a stronger economy uh, that sort. And then I have a few means by which it makes up for the cost on the government, um, which is the lack of the, the reduced need for government redistribution programs from that point forward, as well as just stimulating economic growth in general um, through the, you know, through preferential tax codes for certain business patterns and certain business models will create more businesses, which will stimulate the economy even more, which will generate more tax revenue. And the addition of tax incentives for owners to turn their firm into a cooperative. Firm conversion is one of the best ways to establish co-ops. Firm conversion mitigates the severity of co several co-op limitations such as the startup cost and the lack of certain outside equity sources. This also reduces the need for government redistribution programs, making up for the loss of tax revenue as well as stimulates economic growth, which generates more tax revenue. The addition of preferential slash subsidized loans slash grants for cooperatives. This once again mitigates limitations of capital acquisition and this also reduces the need of government redistribution programs, making up for the loss of tax revenue as well as stimulates economic growth, which generates more tax revenue. I'm just going to say uh, like mitigation of, of, of fiscal costs instead of reading out this bullet point every, every time. The creation of cooperative educational and training programs. Competition and conventional firms are the dominant business culture currently. Programs which seek to educate and train on cooperative business models and worker-slash-management technique will increase the supply of specialized cooperative labor. 
which will make it easier for cooperatives to form and function properly. Um, because right now there is an overabundance of conventional firm specialized labor. The funding of research into cooperatives and their effects. More research into the benefits and limitations of cooperatives firms of cooperative firms will allow us to be able to draft more pointed legislation, which further capitalizes on cooperative values while mitigating the limitations. More research will also allow us to assert, ascertain the validity of the values and limitations mentioned in the document with greater certainty. So once again, another reason why mandates might be bad and we should move with this slowly. That's because once again, like I mentioned at the very beginning of the document, I brought up time and time again, a lot of issues with these studies is, you know, smaller selective sampling. And because of that, a lot of the benefits that may have been presented within all this literature, a lot, maybe the productivity, maybe the resilience, maybe the worker satisfaction or whatever, may not actually pan out to be as strong or even exist at all, um, given a higher abundance of worker cooperatives. And that's why we need research to, you know, both see if a mandate would be a good idea in itself and wouldn't have any adverse consequences. But we also first need more research to ascertain with 100% certainty that a lot of the values, all of the benefits that have been demonstrated within this document are more backed up, are more valid and would be valid on a greater scale as well. Government grants for workers willing to buy firms from owners. Yeah, this is pretty self-explanatory. Firm conversion is one of the best ways by which to establish co-ops. Firm conversion mitigates the severity of several co-op limitations, such as startup cost and lack of certain outside equity sources. And then once again, the same bullet points about mitigating fiscal costs for the government. Capital gains, tax cuts for owners selling part of the firm or the firm in its entirety to the workers. Exact same point in the previous ones. Firm conversion, good. Mitigates negatives of, uh, mitigates limitations of worker co-ops, as well as mitigating uh, fiscal burden for the government. Uh, preferential purchasing rights from empl for employees of a firm facing closure. So allowing the employees to buy a firm that might be being like closed or being like moved abroad or whatever. Once again, exact same points as the previous ones. I don't need to repeat this once again. Promotion of unions. So beyond the other positive effects that unions has, if we talk about unions specifically within, like in regards to worker cooperatives, these are some of the benefits. Unions, especially trade unions, can facilitate the formation of new cooperatives, as well as conversions through union funds and other organizational structures. So yeah, unions, pretty good for, for, uh, for co-ops as well. Fighting against pseudo contract cooperatives. So workers' rights legislation needs to be set in place in order to reduce the risk of being laid off prior to obtaining a vote slash share of the firm. And yeah, those are the major policies. So beyond what is laid out above, beyond these policies, these policies will also collectively increase the likelihood of forming cooperative leagues within economic sectors, right? Because these all incentivize the creation of worker cooperatives in some way or another. And this will lead to more co-op heavy sectors. Why do we want co-op heavy sectors? Well, because cooperative leagues have been shown to increase the magnitude of cooperative benefits, allow for an improved capture of high skill due to the vertical integration of cooperatives, so basically, while in one firm, the compressed wage structure may be, you know, not very great and not very good for high skill laborers, if you have like a league of cooperatives that work together, you may have like a stronger, like a bunch of different co-ops working together. And some of them just have an overall higher wage compression, like the, the wage compression is higher on the scale than other firms. Uh, then the wage compression is like not really going to be the same of an issue because like the wages in general for that firm are just higher. So it's not going to, you know, it's not going to have as much of an, of an issue in regards to people like leaving co-ops and engaging in traditional firms, for example. Yeah, because, you know, you have like a higher range of different cooperatives with different wage structures and with different levels of, yeah, of different levels of wages as well. So uh, you, you might be able to capture more high skill uh, workers, uh, which, yeah, is, is hard to do with just like individual co-ops for the reasons mentioned previously in regards to wage compression. This increases the likelihood of higher quality organizations, which may take more effective action against the free rider problem. The free rider problem is just something that needs to be solved pretty much. There is no real like policy proposal against it, really, at least that I'm aware of right now. Um, the main solution to this is probably just going to be like effective, effective management, effective like work culture that is able to recognize when someone is not pulling their weight and adjust accordingly and, you know, um, put in 
you know, reasonable and appropriate punishments uh, for such, you know, people that are not pulling their weight within the firm. So this isn't so much an inherent problem to cooperatives. It's just like, oh, with, with better management and with better um, just general company culture, this is something that would be solved. And if you have more co-ops um, and, you know, the co-ops grow a lot better, then there is higher incentives for the improvement of those structures and therefore um, the even further like reduction on uh, the prevalence of the free rider problem. It also mitigates the cost of new cooperatives slash wings forming. This is, I answered a question on this previously, so I don't need to go much in depth into it anymore. Uh, it facilitates the acquisition of outside equity through economies of scale. So, for example, um, if you have a, like a larger company, um, for example, like a big, like co-op company, even though there is still that pressure that I mentioned very, like previously with, uh, with like the investment into co-ops being riskier than investment into conventional firms, it is nevertheless the fact that if the company is bigger, then the investment will be generally safer because the company will have probably like a stronger history of seeing how they redistribute wealth seeing you know the ways that they compensate shareholders how much of the you know compensation for workers is from you know their shares how much of it is from their wages and stuff like that on top of that the firm is more to fall back on so generally an investment there will be a lot safer and the risks of the company failing is a lot lower than for a new firm or a smaller firm so there's like there's like small modifiers on their ability to obtain outside equity uh, with the economies of scale and through cooperative leagues that don't exist uh, with just like individual co-ops. Due to the increased capital to fall back on, the disincentives for cooperative innovation are mitigated or eliminated. Basically, bigger co-ops, more capital to fall back on, uh, less risk to engaging in new experimental practices. The likely reductions in unemployment, especially during economic downturns, will also decrease the fiscal burden on the government and as such, further compensate for the fiscal costs and uh, uh, for a lot of the aforementioned policy proposals. So yeah, like we mentioned previously, because worker co-ops could be a potential, you know, way by which to remedy stuff like unemployment, um, this will cut the the role of the government or the amount of money government has to spend on, for example, like unemployment benefits and getting unemployed people like jobs and stuff like that. And as such, that will also balance out and compensate for a lot of the uh, the the government costs for the policies laid out above here and well a little sense at the very end hey if you wish to support the work i do feel free to donate or check out my patreon and yeah that was my 17 page worker cooperative values and limitations research document wow